Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Agilisa Fernández y soy defensora de los derechos de las personas discapacitadas. Bienvenidos a todos los que se encuentran aquí y a aquellos que nos acompañan virtualmente. Good afternoon. My name is Agilisa Fernández and I am a disability rights advocate. I am so honored to be invited to open up this training. <laughs> for respectability, which is a national, nonpartisan, not nonprofit that advocates on behalf of people with disabilities by, by fighting stigmas and advancing opportunities. On behalf of respect, respectability, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you. Those here physically with us, and those joining us virtually to our empowerment training for Latinas with disabilities. Today's training is, is our sixth training in our 2019 Women's Disability Leadership, Inclusion, and Advocacy Series. This is my fourth training in attendance, and I am so blown away by the content, creativity, respect of internet, in, intersectionality, and the work that respectability is doing. At this time, we ask that you shut down all your phones, make sure that they're silent, <laughs> and let's get started. <laughs> For those present at this time during this training, Feel free to wander over to our self-expression graffiti wall to write or draw, either in English or in Spanish, in one side your disabilities and in the other side your abilities. We're going to do something pretty cool later. <laughs> if you look at our slide, you're going to see what that looks like from our past training. Also, if anyone needs earplugs to quiet things down in here, there's music and other actions going on, so you may want quiet time. Just ask Debbie. <laughs> she has a pocket full of them. <laughs> and just know that your level of participation throughout the training is up to you. So, we want to open up with a few motivational quotes by Selena Gomez who lives with disabilities. Always be yourself. There's no one better. You have every right to a beautiful life. Being yourself is all it takes. Other Latinas role models with disabilities are former assistant U.S. Secretary of Labor, Kathy Martinez, who is blind. Actress Michelle Rodriguez, who has ADD. Christina Sands, who has Down syndrome. Sama Haig, who has dyslexia. Singer Demi Lovato, who has bipolar disorder, and painter Frida Kahlo, who had polio and chronic debilitating pain due to an accident. Today's goal, transforming Selena's quote into deliverable tools, today we aim to empower you to take charge of self-advocacy. We'll soon address what self-advocacy means, but in general, it means being your own cheerleader and asking for and getting what you need. Take action, getting involved in New York City's civic life, in the lactants or general community, and take home new experiences new connections, new resources. 
disclaimer. As you see in this disclaimer, we understand that when it comes to disability advocacy, folks have and should have strong ideas and opinions. Hence, we want to clarify to everyone here today that everyone here is exercising free speech and that their views solely, ex solely represent their own views. Thank you. Gracias. We also want to make sure to thank our very generous hosts here today, Gutman College, which does a remarkable job supporting its students with disabilities. Thanks to the other collaborating organizations listed on our slide, and a very big thank you, muchas gracias, goes to the New York Women's Foundation and the Coca-Cola Foundation for their direct support to this effort. It is now my pleasure to pass the mic to Elizabeth Jones of Respectability. Thank you so much. Buenas tardes, everyone. I am really thrilled to be here with you all. Um, so it goes without saying that we need some music to get this training started. So it is my honor to introduce Amanda Lopez, who is a singer, dancer, actress here in New York City with Cuban roots. We learned about Amanda through her little performance with the off-Broadway show Addie and Uno which is the first family musical about disability. It's based on the Real Abilities comic book series. We highly recommend both the musical and the comic book series. And now Amanda and her guitarist, Rebecca Muller, will set the tone for today's awesome training with the song, I Am Woman. Let's give Amanda and Rebecca a big round of applause. I am woman, hear me roar, the numbers too big to ignore, and I know too much is all that
Oops. Okay, great. Okay, the roaring has begun. Uh, hi, I'm Debbie Fink, Respectability Director of Community Outreach and Impact and responsible for this most meaningful training series. It is with the greatest joy, honor, and gratitude that I introduce our keynote speaker. Oops, next. Okay, next slide. Keynote speaker, Carol Robles Roman, whom I tracked down with thanks to her cousin, Bo. Um, Carol, I know you love the song Amanda just sang for us, and you are the woman. To paraphrase Kobe Yamada, you turn your cans into cans and your dreams into plans. I like that. Currently general counsel and dean of faculty at Hunter College, Carol was New York City's department mayor for 12 years and is a board member with the ERA Coalition. She has quite the story to share and feels very strongly about our training as it's the convergence of women's rights, disability rights, and civil rights all within the Latinx community. With no further ado, we are so honored and psyched to hear from you, Carol. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so thank you so much. Um, what's the I don't know how many of you saw the headline in the press release that went out about this wonderful series. Nearly 500,000 women and girls with disabilities live in New York City, right? That's the headline. And it is big that the New York Women's Foundation and other wonderful organizations are working with respectability to do unprecedented empowerment training for Latinas, for women with disabilities. And let me explain to you from a, from a legal perspective and from a policy perspective why this is a as we say in law school, a big damn deal. <laughs> we have, right, we have the EEOC, right, the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission. We have the New York City Commission on Human Rights. We have the New York State Commission on Human Rights. We have the Attorney General's Office, et cetera, et cetera. New York has the best court system in the world, the best and the smartest judges in the world to handle our issues regarding people with disabilities, right, when we get discriminated against. Why do we need empowerment training and why do we need to know about self-advocacy? Because all those entities that I just described, these entities are complaint-driven enterprises. They're run by political entities. Many are well run, some are not. When I ran them, they were very well run. <laughs> just saying. But here's the point. Complaint-driven means that someone has to file a complaint, fill out a form, put their name on a piece of paper, reveal something that they may or may not want to let anybody know. It's private. It's confidential. It may be embarrassing. So I say this. We have learned very powerful lessons in the Me Too movement. Victims of sexual harassment and assault are similarly embarrassed. Sometimes we're ashamed. And that's a personal right to decide how to proceed. But this decision should not be made because there is no help or because the entity has no expertise on how to help us. So it's because of this, much of my personal passion throughout my career has been to champion the right to self-advocate in all of its forms and to demand that all organizations that I have worked with have helped lead, been on the board, or just volunteer with to have this ethos. People have fought very, very hard to pass these civil rights laws that protect us, for us to enjoy these rights. But I want to ask you this. What is the purpose of having a law in the book that looks so grand when people talk about it if it's not enforced? What good is it if we do not ask? if we do not report, if we do not sometimes complain or even demand. And worse, if people don't even care that they need to follow these laws because they know 
that we usually do not ask or report or complain or demand. So that's why I am so grateful to Respectability for leading this conversation and for creating this platform for us to discuss self-advocacy and opportunities for civic engagement. The sad truth is our voices are not usually present in the halls of power where these laws are made. But that's now changing. Thank you, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who happens to be my elected congresswoman and who my family had the honor of all voting for. We are not at the enforcement agencies that are setting the agenda, that are funding the priorities, but that's now changing too, right? Thank you, Attorney General Leticia James, a former colleague yes. who served on the New York City Council with us and champions us today. <coughs> but we are here, we are now, and we are organized. And that is not going to change because together we will change these outcomes. We will shift our conversations, our voices, the voices of Latinas, of women with disabilities in New York City will be heard. So I've been asked to share some of my stories, some of my strategies that I hope inspire. Um, I've never shared some of these, uh, but my friend here has uh, been such a tremendous influence to me and has told me that these are the stories that women with disabilities need to hear. And I needed to hear them coming out of my own mouth as well. So part of my journey actually started in 2002 as deputy mayor. One of the agencies that I oversaw was the New York City Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities. And I came in with a very hard charging view, right? Understand, I was the former Special Inspector General for Bias Matters. I was the former Assistant Attorney General. So anybody came to me with an issue about discrimination and I was like, we're going to investigate. You know, I wanted the death penalty and they're like, no, Cal, it's not a criminal matter. I'm like, okay, I get it, I get it. But I wanted full-on investigation, full-on law enforcement. Now, our Commissioner for Disabilities one day, we were chatting, his name was Matt Saplin, if any of you ever worked with him. Yes. Dear, so God rest his soul. So the late Matt Saplin mentioned that he had gone to a restaurant with his service dog, and Matt was blind, and they had refused to see him because of compass. For those of you that know him, you remember compass. Like, is this a joke? Michael Bloomberg's commissioner for people with disabilities is being discriminated against? And the mayor loved Compass. So I knew I was going to have all the resources. And I said to Matt, we're sending the Human Rights Commission in tomorrow. We're going to do an investigation. And then I looked around and I said, and the Department of Health, too. You know, just for, <laughs> just for good measure. And Matt said, no, Carol, let me handle this. I really don't think they understand the law. Let me go back and let me explain it to them. And if it doesn't work, you can send in the Human Rights Commission and the Department of Health. <laughs> and he comes back and he tells us, you know what, I got, it's solved. They really didn't understand. And frankly, thank you for that Department of Health threat because it made me think that they're in restaurants all the time and they are such a strategic partner for us to now to go into the restaurants and train them on the issue of service animals, etc. What a, what a powerful life lesson that was for me. Self-advocacy, education, public information, with the specter of law enforcement in the background, right? And the power of government to make a powerful, powerful change. So I championed my inner Matthew Saplin a few years back, when three years ago I was diagnosed with a, with a major ailment that would change my life and my advocacy for forever. So it turns out my work as a court administrator in 2001 in the immediate aftermath of the World Trade Center terrorism attack <coughs> exposed me to dangerous environmental toxins. I was working with the New York State court system right in the zone to get the court system back. Imagine a city with no courts, with no judges. Justice just was at a standstill. And I remember the chief judge telling me at the time, Carol, justice delayed is justice denied. We have to get the courts back up and running. And we did and we were a block away from the zone. And we also work with the bar associations to recruit lawyers to help the victims. And my reward for my good deeds, I found out, was stage three lung cancer. 
So since that initial diagnosis, I am now certified as a 9-11 first responder under the Zaroga Act, the statute that was passed to help first responders and survivors in the aftermath. Wow. First responder? I'm going to ask you, what does a first responder look like? Like, doesn't he have like a hose <laughs> and carry like a badge and a gun, right? No. This is what a first responder looks like, a Latina lady lawyer, right? <laughs> A life lesson. So my treatments were an ordeal in every sense of the word. <coughs> and my employer at the time handled it all terribly. So I remember thinking, can this, is this like a comedy skit? Is this kind of like Matt Saplin, the commissioner? Um, a civil rights attorneys, civil rights being, I'm being discriminated against? This feels very weird. And out of the blue, I was recruited to lead a national organization whose mission is, uh, as a coalition, to pass the Equal Rights Amendment in Congress. And I had always wanted, that was like my bucket list, I always wanted a job where I would be in Congress and walking the halls and, you know, knocking on doors of Congress people. But this was like bad timing, right? Um, and so I thought about it and I, I channeled my inner Matt Saplin and I said, you know, I'm going to be transparent, I'm going to be honest. And my employer-to-be said, when can you start? <laughs> so, so they worked around my treatments, my schedule, um, and all those issues. And I have to tell you, I never worked harder in my life, um, but at the same time on my own terms. And, and while I'm sort of negotiating, you know, the things that happen when one is um, not 100% and going to treatments, I am leading the charge around the country in having the first hearing ever on the Equal Rights Amendment. And I'm thinking, am I going to pull this off? Like, I know this is like bad talk in an interview with someone who's going to hire you, but now I'm actually going to Congress and trying to convince them to do it. And Congressman Maloney says, sign me up. And there I am, two months later, in a table just like this, testifying before 15 Congress people sitting next to an international celebrity who then, releases, <laughs> who then releases a video of the hearing and like in three days that video is seen over a million times, right? And I don't even know about the video. <laughs> my daughter calls me up and I've told this story. My daughter calls me up. She's a student in Georgetown and she's like, Mom, my friend just called me. She looks exactly like me, right? So she's like me, but minus some years. <laughs> I just saw a video of a lady with Alyssa Milano that looks just like you, but obviously it's not you. And so my dad was like, oh no, what is my problem? <laughs> He's like, mom, that video has been seen over a million times. Now, of course, I don't see the video, and I don't think, wow, this is so badass. I'm in Congress, and look what I'm doing. I just see the really bad haircut because my, <laughs> hair, because my hair is falling out and I'm just like, oh my god, I'm terrible. My hair, well, my hair was falling out and I'm wearing this really tacky headband and it was, and my husband's like, girl, you just accomplished something that hasn't been done in 40 years. You are about to pass the Gold Amendment. <laughs> and I created the tagline, ERA. Women of color lead the way because we got everyone to testify we're all women of color. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled because I'm actually living out the advice that as a lawyer I had been giving throughout my career, which was to be as authentic as you can be within the realm of what you feel comfortable with. Um, and that was hard for me because even though I was saying it, I wasn't really doing it. So one, one story that I had shared with my friend here who said, Carol, please tell the Delta story. I said, I can't tell the Delta story. She goes, you must tell the Delta story. So here's the Delta story. I encourage you to say. <laughs> so here's the Delta story. So you hate it. This is the woman. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm traveling. Probably, you know, like my husband's like, uh, you know, like, you got radiation tomorrow. How are you going to be in Virginia? I said, no, no, no. The doctor explained it to me. I come in at 5 in the morning. I get my radiation. Then I get on the plane. And he's like, don't know how you're doing it. Good luck. 
So I did one of my things, and I'm in Virginia, and I'm flying back, and I'm not feeling well, right? We all know what that's like. There's some days, that it's just not a good day, and you know it, and you need to look at somebody and say, I'm going to need a nap, going to need this. So I get to the airport, and I have my mask on, because I have to, my compromised immune system, and I go up, they, they're boarding, and I go, I'm disabled, and I'm about to board, and the woman looks at my ticket, and she says, oh, there's something wrong with your ticket, you can't board yet, you stand right here. And I said, I'm, I'm actually having problems standing, and I, I should have gotten a wheelchair, I didn't. So she says, you have to stand right there. And I go, ma'am, I'm a person with disabilities, you see my mask, you see I don't feel well, please, priority boarding is for, you know, for us. Um, and she says, no, 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 it has to be the first class. So I guess because she didn't appreciate my self-advocacy, she made me stand there. And I was the last person to board the paint. So what ended up happening, which is something that never happened to me in my whole life, I started to cry in public. So I'm, imagine this, I'm in an airport in Virginia with a mask, crying like an idiot, standing there with, I guess, an imaginary dunce cap, because I'm not quite sure what I had done. And so they're just about to close the chicken. Okay, now you can board. So I get on the plane, I imagine, now I'm more frazzled, not feeling well, and I just go to the stewardess, can you please, you know, and I guess I was standing in the wrong spot or I was blocking a man's view, and the man looks at me and he yells at me. He says, oh, get out of the way. You people should know where to go. And I said, oh my God, I'm you people now. Somehow, so I, I turned around, and the oddest thing, this was during the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, and he looked like Brett Kavanaugh. <laughs> and so I turned around and I, and I just, I, I'm crying and I said, you know what, I'm, I, I cannot, I cannot let Brett Kavanaugh get away with it. <laughs> so, so I looked at him and I said, listen Brett Kavanaugh, you just verbally assaulted me and that's not allowed, so stop it and I'm reporting you right now. So I looked up and the poor steward and she was saying, how could he talk to you like that? That's outrageous. And I'm like, oh, it's like your job to do something, not to just sympathize. I go, ma'am, what are you supposed to do? And she said, I I'm so sorry, I don't know. She said, I really, I really don't know. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really sorry. And she apologized, but she had no clue. So I sat down, I'm crying, feeling sorry for myself, and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Matt Stoplin, and I, I took out my phone, and I tweeted the CEO, I looked it up in two seconds flat before we were in the air, and I tweeted the CEO of Delta. I wrote the customer service line, I sent another email, and I said, oh, nothing will happen, but at least I feel better. <laughs> so when the plane lands, just before, once we hit, my phone rings. Hello, uh, hello, this is James Smith. I'm the special assistant to the CEO of Delta Airlines. I wanna let you know that the captain is aware of your complaint. He has taken the necessary steps against that abusive passenger. <laughs> you get the phone and he goes, and the captain will be there shortly to escort you to a special area because now he needs information about what happened to you in Virginia. So I said, oh my God, am I in trouble? And it was, it was an apology. Oh, and by the way, as soon as the captain has finished talking to you, he is instructed to call the CEO's office and give a full report what happened. Oh man. So I tell the CEO everything through the, through the captain, and then the captain's very apologetic, and I said, Captain, how do I know I just didn't just waste half an hour telling you this? He goes, no, I, I swear, I swear, I'm going to make sure, and I said, prove it. I said, put up your hands, and I made him take an oath. <laughs> <laughs> captain, very important, with the thing on, and I said, I swear, he goes, I swear, I will report to Delta Airlines, I will report to Delta Airlines, you must change your policies on how to treat people with disabilities, I will change the policy. So, my, when I got home and I told my husband, so I go, I think you went a little nuclear with that. Because so, everything was okay until the part where you told me to make sure I swear, because that's just, that's just over the top and that's just wrong. So. So one last self-advocacy story, and it's, it's something that I think all of us should really put into our heads to decide, you know, and you'll, you'll find yourselves in some place in your life and it may have nothing to do with medical. But I, um, I get through my treatments, you know, all kind of good, and the hair grows the back really weird, but you know, that was, if that's the worst of it, that's okay. It looks great. Uh, thank you, you know. <laughs> my, my kid was like, oh, mommy, your hair. And I said, how come you didn't cry when they took out my lung? He's like, oh. he was like well, because it didn't really, you know, <laughs> I didn't see it. I didn't see it. So anyway, the, um, 
I start doing my research and I find out that there is this like cutting edge medicine that is like the, like had just been passed a year before and I qualify for it, it's my same illness, it's my same genetic makeup, you know, blah, 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 blah. So I asked my doctor and I said, oh my God, look at this. Um, you know, I'm not stupid, I know the prognosis for, for what I have. And she says, oh, Carol, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry you don't qualify for that. That's not for your stage. And I'm like, lady, I got stage three. <laughs> She's like, nope, you don't qualify. So I'm like, hmm, I'm going to put on my don't take a no for an answer hat, which I think you may have picked up. I put on a lot. <laughs> so I put on my little hat, I do my research, and I find, like, the world expert in the country on this genetic makeup for my kind of illness, blah, blah, who has expertise in this medicine. He's in Boston. I asked a friend of a friend to get me like an immediate appointment. I get it within two weeks. I fly to Boston. I'm, I'm making my case. I said, I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm, I don't qualify. If you don't qualify, you don't qualify. Um, and the other piece of it was that the medicine is so state of the art and so new that insurance doesn't cover it. And it's a thousand dollars a pill. <laughs> So I'm thinking, I'm going to sell the house, I, 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 but I'm, you know, I, I want it. So I get to the doctor, I'm, I'm pitching, and he looks at me and he goes, I agree with you. You should get this medicine. You should. And I said, well, I was told, and he said, the Federal Drug Administration just changed those guidelines the day before yesterday. You could start tomorrow. And I'm like, what am I going to do? I said, yeah, but the cost. And he says, did you say you were a, a, a first responder? I go, yeah, 9-11. He goes, oh, the 9-11 fund will pick up every cent of this. So last week, after being on the drug, I say oh, about a year, um, I'm cancer free. <laughs> Last week, I got my scan results. I said, well, I'm going to save this for my, for my presentation. The doctors looked more shocked than my husband. <laughs> my husband was like, well, I knew she was going to pull this off. <laughs> the doctor was like, wow. So, so that last story, very personal, but I share it because, I mean, think of just all the op uh, obstacles that I had to, like, tease out there, right? The cost, the fact that it wasn't in my stage, um, and, and I'm not mindful of also sort of the miracle that just happened also, that I just happened to be there. I, I put myself in the right place at the, at the right time, uh, certainly through the grace of God, who was leading sort of a lot of magical miracles uh, in the back. So I look forward to meeting all of you and seeing how we can work together uh, moving forward on the issues around women with disabilities, on the issues of empowerment, and just how to put on that don't take no for an answer hat. And don't take it off until you want to take off your hat. Thank you. Okay. She said the best news <laughs> are here and uh, Thank you for your courage in, in self-disclosing and sharing your story, Carol. And thank you for that, the, the fairy tale ending. I mean, that's really a, a gift. Um, wow. So um, we have time for a few questions. So there are cards on the table. So if you have a burning question for Carol, um, please feel free to write it down and pass it to Rebecca. And Rebecca will bring them up to Carol. But Carol, I have to say in the meantime, when you told me the Delta story, you left out. I left out. I heard about the captain. I'm embarrassed. My husband said, I didn't tell anybody that. I love, I love, love, love that story. I love that story. So um, you also shared when, when you were telling me that story, and, I, and I'd like you to sort of brush in or to step into this if you wish. Um, your thought when it happened to you and you burst into tears, your thought in terms of if this could happen to you, who has the education and the background that you do, you know, that you saw the bigger picture in terms of how it must impact others, 
um, without, without those skill sets that you have. Can you address that a little more? Yeah, I mean, I, I felt that at, at, at two points in my, in my last three-year journey, but that was the most dramatic one. Um, and that was the reason as I was, I, listen, we go to, you know, we go to shopping centers and people don't take care of us. And, you know, things happen to us all the time. Um, but at that particular moment, I said, you know what? I'm not going to be satisfied with just doing a teachable moment, you know, speech to somebody here or, 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 or writing a note. Um, I want to make sure this never happens again. Um, and, and usually in, in the olden days, I used to write letters to like the general counsel and get letters back. And, and I become a little sort of media savvy and I said, you know what, I'm going to see if this Twitter thing kind of works. <laughs> um, and it does. And it does. And that was the purpose. I want to just, I, and, and what I do is, I mean, I'm a little, I'm a little bit, I, I'll send the tweet, and then they direct message you, and then I send them a copy of my bio. So they go like, oh, by the way, this is who you just messed with. Uh, so that's the, that's the other little, you know. Right. And they, they messed with the wrong woman? Thank goodness. Because, because your self-advocacy in that moment has clearly impacted lives of, thank you, Rebecca, of so many so many travelers with disabilities. And uh, so on behalf of all the travelers with disabilities, we thank you. Thank you, Norma. And the other issue, and this I had done um, when I was running a women's rights organization, there is another issue just around the treatment of women on airlines and the fact that most airlines are not trained. So I actually already knew that if there's something happening in the flight, um, something short of you know, a criminal act, they really don't know what to do in real time. Right. right. And so that's something, that's a message that needs to be, especially in this post Me Too era, that we're, we're cognizant that, you know, crazy stuff is happening and people need to put a stop to it right away. Right. Thank you. Okay, so we have time for a question. Um, can you please share a bit about your upbringing? Oh boy, that's a great, that's a great uh, question. Um, I was born and raised in, in Brooklyn, New York, and, and I'm one of six, and my mom... Where are you in the lineup? I'm number three. So I'm number three, Fighting six, in the five girls, five girls and one boy. So I was raised in New York, and I was also raised in Puerto Rico. So it was one of those that was kind of traditional. Um, I'm going to be 56, so in my era, people went back and forth. Um, and my mom was supposed to go to law school and didn't, you know, had kids, etc. So she always had this ethos of, you know, that's not right or that's not just. And I never, I never really thought about it. And my sister, who's actually a, a professor at, at Brooklyn College, she interviewed my mother for an article um, that was subsequently published in the Encyclopedia of Latina. And it's sort of my, my mother's history of how, at, at a very young age, she was always sort of inserting herself in things, and even when she, when she became a social worker and a teacher, uh, she was always looking at sort of the social justice fabric. And that was the first time when I realized that she had kind of passed some of that on to, to many, of her, many of us, her kids. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, will you be joining us for the small discussion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. All right, so I want to say um, we're going to move on, um, but we are going to for the, those with other questions, um, you will have the privilege and honor of joining Carol in the small group session, uh, Conversations with Carol. Um, so let's give Carol a round of applause and then we'll thank <laughs> Carol. Um, don't go too far because um, while words cannot suffice, they cannot suffice, we have a special gift through music, through music to you. Where the brave dare not go 
Possible dream. Some today during the month of May. May is National Mental Health Awareness Month. As a mental health advocate, I am a proud Latina with a mental health condition. I am also a board member of DREAM, which stands for Disability Rights education, activism, and mentoring. With this definition, we are all dreaming together today. DREAM is a national organization for and by college students with disabilities, supported by the National Center for College Students with Disabilities. We advocate for disability, culture, community, and pride, and hope to serve a virtual disability cultural center for students who want to connect with other students with disabilities. Today, I dream the possible dream. I am honored to have been invited by Debbie at respectability to play an active role here today. I am honored to follow Senora Robles Roman and her incredible leadership as a woman, as a Latina, as a first responder, as a woman who publicly owns her disability, signaling to the rest of us that it is okay, that we can have a disability and live a life of leadership. And I am honored to introduce Dr. Shirley Leda, a critical criminologist and professor in CUNY system. Dr. Leda is also an instructor in mental health first aid, which is a national program. So today, I, we dream the possible dream because we are gathered here today to empower ourselves, our sisters, our aunts, our mothers, and our daughters. As we bust the stigma on mental health in our community. We are not locas. We are local motives. <laughs> it is an honor to introduce Dr. Leda. <laughs> Good afternoon. 
I needed to check the time. Uh, it is an honor to have been asked to speak today, and I just really want to let you know that I feel a privilege to be speaking to you all. So thank you so much for the invitation, and thank you for that fabulous introduction. Um, on a personal note, um, I'm, uh, you know, when we talk about our mental health, that's, you know, there's such a stigma and such, you know, a mysticism around it that many of us are very reluctant to talk about it. And I'm happy to discuss my own personal history because it's definitely brought me to where I am today in terms of how I try to advocate not just for myself but for my students. Uh, for the people I deal with in my research, I study the immigrant population in particular or those who are vulnerable to deportation. So I look at how being deportable um, impacts folks on a very, on a psychological level, right? The trauma that is imposed upon the state, upon these folks, right? But also as a person of the community, I live in a heavily gentrifying area and we know that people who suffer from mental illness become um, funneled into the criminal justice system unfairly, right? The largest mental health facility in the city is, like, is in Rikers Island, right? So we know that there are all, the, all of these different paths, whether it's a family member, ourselves, a student, a person we live with or work with, deal with in our everyday lives. Mental health is always at the forefront. And many of us don't know, clearly sometimes we see when someone is at the precipice of a mental health crisis or is experiencing a mental health crisis and we don't know what to say, we don't know what to do. Um, and sometimes uh, we want to, and, and that's when I got involved in the mental health first aid um, uh, initiative through the NYC Thrive. There's information in the back if you're all interested in it. Um, I, can, I find it a privilege to be able to conduct those trainings. I took the training and I liked it so much I became an instructor, right? So, because um, I don't have enough to do. <laughs> um, but I just, you know, the value of addressing our mental health, right, there is that stigma. People aren't well informed in the Latinx community. We know, right, that you know, our people don't go to therapy. Right? Uh, like you said, <laughs> and uh, the fact is that we're not always, uh, we can't conquer everything on our own. Sometimes we need help. Everyone needs help at some point, right? Whether it's a, a more than healthy level of anxiety, right? All of us experience anxiety, but some are healthier right before a job interview or before a big test, but sometimes that level of anxiety gets to be a little bit too much. At what point is it too much? How can we help ourselves and other people deal with that, right? So I think that part of the mental health training that I conduct is uh, just educating people on what mental health and what mental illness is, right? And it's okay, right? It's okay to experience. We all have sometimes some hard times. And some of us handle them better than others. Um, and some of us need help, and that's okay to need help. And once we get rid of that stigma, right, once we accept that sometimes we all need help, from, you know, occasionally, then I think that opens the door to more people seeking and getting the treatment that they need and that they deserve, right? A couple of years ago, um, I went through some issues, some personal problems, but I buried them, right, because I had a dissertation to finish. And in, when you're a PhD student, it is ingrained in your head the only D you're interested in is dissertation. <laughs> the only anything, you know, the dissertation has to be the number one priority in your life. I remember I had professors tell me, if anybody saw your social media, they wouldn't think you're taking your dissertation seriously, right? Because of social media, apparently. Um, and I just remember that I buried a lot of trauma. I went through a really, really terrible um, relationship that um, it traumatized me, but I buried that trauma, right? Um, because I needed to finish my dissertation. And so when I finished my dissertation, about four months later, I found I couldn't get out of bed. And I found that I couldn't function well. And I, did, I was not interested in doing anything that I enjoyed, right? Um, and I like reading, and I like working out, and I also like going to the movies, and I like, you know, sports. And I just, I just was having a hard time just doing anything that I enjoyed. Um, and it impacted my life, right? It truly became a disability because it disrupted my life in a variety of ways, right? My ability to live, laugh, learn, and love. It really did. And um, uh, I didn't know what to do. I sought therapy, you know. I, I was convinced to seek therapy because I was like, I don't need therapy. This will, you know, this will be all right. It's just a passing phase. Um, and I had to be convinced that I needed help, that I couldn't do this alone. 
And um, then after the election, when I saw the people that I work with, my undocumented students, I'm their faculty advisor, when I saw the people that I research, that are people, people I work with in my research, when they started to exhibit clear signs, symptomatic of PTSD because of, you know, what's happening in, in the political world, um, I really started to get interested. Um, and that's when I, you know, started to go right in. Um, we know that our people don't seek help. Um, we know that it takes about 10 years for a person who realizes that they, need, they have a mental illness to actually seek medical or um, some professional attention. That is too long of a time. We need to right, shrink that amount of time, and the way we do it is to remove the stigma and the mysticism that's around mental illness. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring, because I know I'm going to run out of time because I gab, you know, um, and I keep, my hair keeps getting stuck on me. <laughs> it's going to come out on the web again. Um, so the latest numbers from the Centers of Disease Control, um, almost one in two, right, almost 50 percent, 48 percent of Latinx high school girls have felt persistently sad or ho hopeless within the past year. As I'm an auntie, I don't have children, but I'm very involved in my niece's life. That is a scary number, right? Um, more than one in five, right, so almost a quarter have seriously considered suicide within the past year. And one in ten have actually attempted, right, to a complete suicide. That is a scary number. And when we think about the level of anxiety, I'm sorry that I'm doing this, but it's really problem. <laughs> the level of anxiety that our young people feel, just in general, right? I mean, like, I think that we discount our young people. You know, we say things like, and, you know, they, they're, they're referred to like microaggressions. Like, what problems could you possibly have? You're too young. Um, but we know as teenagers, there's a lot of stuff going on developmentally, there's physically, also identity issues, right? So if we go to the next one, for queer, for queer Latina girls, 64% have felt persistently sad or hopeless. And nearly one in two have seriously considered suicide, and a quarter have actually right, attempted to die by suicide. So those numbers are huge, particularly when we talk about specific communities. So just in the Latina population, Latina girls, the number of, uh, the amount of depression and suicide is high, and then when we think about the LGBTQ community, it's even higher, right? And I think those numbers deserve the attention, right? We need to get away from this, our people don't seek treatment, right? This is where the self-advocacy, the self-empowerment comes from. Um, I think that one of the things we do is get away from the microaggressions, right? Um, we don't want to dismiss the problems that our young people feel. As a professor, sometimes I'm like, oh boy, you know, midterm exams come in and all of a sudden everyone is stressed out and anxious, right? That's a habit that I needed to get out of when, um, as a person who deals with young people on a daily basis, I think that we need to give credence to our young people particularly our people, uh, young people who belong to vulnerable communities, right? So the number here is for the LGBTQ community, but I can tell you firsthand, and I'm, I'm writing an article about it, that the number of young people who have non-citizen status is also very high when you talk about depression and um, I, uh, suicidal ide um, ideation. It is a very high percentage for all our young people who belong to these vulnerable communities, whether it's um, gender-based or religion-based or citizen um, status-based, right? So one of the things I'd like for all of us to do as the older people, and I know there's some young people here as well, you can help, you're not many young people, I'm just a little older than you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little younger than you. Um, is let's do better in asking our friends how they're feeling and maybe if we've noticed something, right? So one of the things I'd like people to say is practice that I notice sentence, right? So it's, Adilta, I've noticed that you haven't been joining us for coffee lately. Is everything okay? Right. Or, you know, surely I've noticed that you were crying the other day. Is everything okay? So if all of us practice that one I noticed sentence and use it, um, we, we get it out of the way and then we can use it for someone that we're friendly with. It'll help and it'll take us a long way. My time is up. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Little little stage shift here. Larissa and Jessica.
One moment, because who has the other book, the other, uh, another white binder? White binder. Is it this one? No. Oh, here it is. Okay. Okay. People make plans and God laughs. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lara. That was so incredibly meaningful, and what a powerful way for us to highlight May's National Mental Health Awareness Month. Adilta, what a rising disabilities advocate you are. <laughs> I am Vivian Bass, and so proud and pleased to serve on Respectability's Executive Committee. It has been such a pleasure a pivotal thing, playing a pivotal part of this training series. And I know, speaking for several of us, how bittersweet it is that this is our grand finale. We're so moved to be sharing this day with each of you. Of note, Dr. Lara will be facilitating a small group session on self-advocacy and mental health later this afternoon. We're looking forward to that as well. And Dr. Leiris' colleague, Dr. Kaliras Salaramiris um, of CUNY School of Medicine, will be leading a powerful small group session on self-advocacy and racial bias. <coughs> and Crystal Vasquez of Gottman Community College's Accessibility Program will facilitate a small group session on self-advocacy and housing benefits. I now have the honor and privilege of introducing two truly amazing allies, both from the world of HR Fortune 500 companies who will engage in a fireside chat. Please join me in introducing Clarissa Ramos uh, Car Carapelli, Managing Director and Global Head of Corporate Employee Relations with J.P. Morgan, and Jessica Palacios, a Vice President of Human Resource Partner of BlackRock. I now invite everyone to engage your imagination envisioning a stone fireplace holding a warm, <laughs> crackling fire, and Clarissa and Jessica sitting in comfy seats as they chat together while sharing a hot pot of coffee or tea. Let's join <laughs> Jessica and Clarissa. Thank you so much. I think the fire is in the room. I can kind of feel the heat a little bit. So thank you all for getting everything warmed up. Um, and thank you to Debbie and team for putting this amazing event together. Um, I have to admit to all of you, this is not the first time Clarissa and I have been on stage together. Um, I had the privilege of um, being mentored by Clarissa when I started my career in human resources at J.P. Morgan Chase, and so um, really it is my honor to kind of uh, have a bit of a reunion here, and so so great to see you, and so great, thank you so much for having us again. Um, when, we, when I was um, preparing with Debbie for this particular session, she asked, what does self-advocacy mean to me, and how do we translate over that to Spanish? And I said, Abogacia feels so legal, and I love our legal friends. Um, but, you know, it just, it just feels a little bit not like an everyday word. And so I called mamá, I called papá, I called abuela, and I said, you know, help me, um, you know, I'm crowdsourcing a little bit for this definition. Um, and what I came up with was autoempoderamiento, which is a little bit more on the empowerment side, and I think a really nice theme to just dovetail into our um, fireside chat. Will you say it again, please? Autoempoderamiento. Okay. Um, and with that, um, I would just like to spend a few moments here um, diving a little bit deeper into Clarissa's background and finding out, you know, maybe what got you interested in a career in HR. Sure. First, I want to say thank you so much for the invitation. I feel honored to be here. And 
the power in this room is extraordinary, and I'm very touched by it, very touched. So, so let's get me? started <laughs> with, um, yeah, let's just a quick personal story. What got you involved in human resources and maybe um, tied into how, why you consider yourself an ally to this community? Sure. I didn't know I'd end up in human resources. <laughs> I took a journey in my life um, that I had no control over, but ultimately got me to a place where working with people was important to me. I was uh, raised in orphanages, so I made a lot of change in my life, going from institution to institution, different staff, different schools, different dynamics. Mm -hmm always feeling that the, 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 the earth under me, the floor under me was unsteady, that I couldn't control the unsteadiness. I didn't know what that meant, was. I didn't know what that was about. I couldn't label it. But I realized there were people around me in similar conditions, in similar circumstances that I could be helpful to. And that actually empowered me. It made me feel more steady in my present state as a child in the past and my present state today as a, an officer in a very significant organization. And it has helped me to realize that I can do it in a couple of ways. I've done some work in the not-for-profit with ex-offenders and substance abusers, and that was very meaningful. But I could take that and my past and also bring it into the corporate environment and that there is much to be solved in a corporate environment and there's a lot that goes on. And it's not perfect in terms of people. We all come to a place with anxiety, with concerns, with physical, mental, other kinds of issues. Some of them are very obvious, and some of them are not. But all of that has, has brought me to where I am today. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, I'll, I'll take a moment and, and share as well why I consider myself an ally to this community. Um, my aunt is actually a C4 quadriplegic. Um, and she suffered a gunshot wound in her brainstem, um, and so she can't move from the neck down. And my um, wonderful grandmother, who, now that I'm a mom, I understand um, why she takes care of her and will probably do so um, until her last day. Um, so again, thank you so much for, for having us here today. Um, similarly, I am inspired um, in this um, career in human resources because I can go home every day and feel like I helped someone and I did help advocate, whether it is on behalf of an employee, on behalf of a manager, um, on behalf of you know, society or just enlightening folks on really what is important out there. What resonated with some of the stories earlier is that people really don't know. And sometimes giving that, assuming that's intent and giving that benefit of the doubt is really <laughs> rule number one of engagement for, for our line of work. And going into it with that humility and that education mindset is, is incredibly important. So we're talking about sharing stories, and we really want to help you all navigate what it's like to disclose in the workplace, and that's really what we're going to um, talk, go into next. Um, so there's a little bit of like a how, what, if, when, um, you know, kind of scenario. So Clarissa, tell us, you know, what have you seen work? What are some best practices that you can share with respect specifically to um, disclosing a disability in the workplace? I think if I think about workplaces in general, um, there is that unsteadiness, that discomfort, that worry, that anxiety. If you're not sure, you can fit in. Mm -hmm. And there is the shyness around talking to anyone around about that. Mm -hmm. The fear of someone finding out and what that implication might be to you in the workplace. And what's important is that we're encouraging people to come forward, to feel comfortable in the work environment, to feel like it's safe. Mm -hmm. That's important private work that I want to do when I'm with employees in the workplace and outside the workplace, that it's really okay. It's an environment where we're open, we're supportive, and the, the reality is if we don't know, we can't really think about what the accommodation might be, and we can't serve to the individual what that reasonable accommodation may be. So it's really two-sided. We need to be there to listen and be supportive, but we also need to understand what the need is and we depend on individuals to do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I can share um, from my experience as well. We like to say, we don't know what we don't know. Um, so it's really up to um, the employees and the managers coming to us and seeking us out to, 
to, to obtain that knowledge and even obtain um, a level of knowledge that they may not, not have any experience with. And so that is kind of our role is to kind of guide um, the organization through that process. Um, tell us first of what happens after disclosure. I think people in the room are probably also thinking about their privacy. So can you talk a little bit about that? Privacy is at the core. It's critical. It's very important because you've taken the risk in any environment, particularly not my environment, just because an individual is taking the risk to disclose doesn't mean we have the right to tell that story. It's not our story. It's the individual story. And I feel very strongly about that. And there are privacy laws that are very important that we want to make sure that we stand by. And the fact that you disclose in a work environment, you should be able to feel confident that that disclosure is about finding the right solution for you as an individual. It is not about any other reason. It is really about making sure you have the tools, the access, and the opportunity to be at your very best when you walk into the workplace and when you're in the workplace. And most of us spend most of our time in the workplace. So to make it the right situation to the best that we can is really at the core for us. Absolutely. Um, so we do have a few minutes left here, um, and we want this to be as useful as possible to anybody who may be navigating a tricky situation in the workplace. And so I would like to open the floor um, for questions, if you have any. Um, I think the procedure is to write them down <laughs> on a card, right? Um, and we will be able to um, answer those if you would like to submit anything anonymously. Um, while we get those questions yeah. queued up, I'll just tell a quick story um, with respect to best practices that I've seen um, in, in, in the workplace for an individual where we're, again, human resources brokering the transaction between um, the employee and the manager. Um, similar to our friend Carol, who shared the story about the CEO of Delta, feeling strongly that, that is, HR has a point of view and we believe um, you know, privacy is important, disclosure is important, and tax around all of this is important. But of course, um, organizations are filled with people and sometimes people make mistakes and so don't be afraid to do what Carol did and go to uh, around your manager and to the head of human resources or you know whatever um, uh, resources are available at your particular workplace because it may be um, that a manager does not know or has not crossed this bridge before and it's important again to um, just assume that the person does not have the right information um, before kind of jumping to, to, to a feeling of a place that is intentional and it's discriminatory. Um, the other thing I will share is that I have seen plenty of compromises and, and maybe Clarissa can share as well. Um, it's not always the accommodation that is requested that is actually implemented. Um, what is required by law is for us to engage into, in a proactive dialogue into what, an, what type of accommodation would be possible. Um, and so just something to know when you enter into this conversation of requesting an accommodation for your disability, know that it may not be the exact thing you requested, but the employer is working with you to try and create a solution. It might not be your top choice, but, but, that, is, but that is something I have seen as well. Anything on that before we take our yeah. question? I, um, I think that's really important to really appreciate that it may feel like the other individuals are discriminating, mm -hmm. but more often than not what we find is it's a lack of understanding, a lack of experience, a lack of knowing what to do or fear of moving forward. And so some of it is on us and some of it is on the individual to take that risk to move into that discomfort to have the dialogue. Great. Okay, Claire, so we have our first question. How to better encourage students who are about to join the workplace? So how to ask for help. What's your advice for the students out there? I would say just tap into yourself. Really hear your voice and bring that voice forward. You know what you need and what you want. You articulate it the best way you can and you hope that the other person's receiving it but be willing to spend the time to explain it. Because the information that comes from you as the individual is the in best information we have. Absolutely. And it doesn't hurt to practice the conversation before yeah. you go into the conversation. Um, and if you plan to have that conversation over the phone, which can be difficult, um, but may, that may be the case because of an interview or because um, the manager is located in another, another city, et cetera. Um, if you are having that conversation over the phone, my advice is to take that call and stand. 
something happens differently when you deliver a message when you stand. Um, they don't know you're standing, but it helps you. <laughs> um, I just find that when you deliver a message, you can, you know, do so more confidently um, when you're when you're standing if you can. If you can, of course. Any other questions? Do we have last minute here? Mm -hmm. Let's go. Okay, Clarissa. How do you report microaggression types of issues, especially if not directed towards you? So we have an ally in the room that wants to um, potentially notify HR on behalf of someone else. So I'm in a position where I hear about the issues, the concerns, the worries, the complaints. And where we sit in this part of my organization, employee relations, we want to hear those concerns and we want to be able to problem solve. So I think you'll find in lots of organizations and in school systems, there is a way to raise concerns. They have formal ways and informal ways. You find an ally or someone who is influential or someone who really has the empathy mm -hmm. and really wants to spend the time and you let them know what's going on and perhaps they can help you bring it forward or again, tap into that voice and just push it out and just put it out there. And it's scary. But I really encourage people to do that. It's really important to advocate for yourself. Advocate for yourself. And don't be afraid to tweet the CEO. Do uh, <laughs> <Sarah. Hey. laughs> you ever find yourself in that situation? <laughs> yes, Carol. Um, the, the advice you've given. Let's get a mic so that our virtual joiners can. You've given such invaluable advice. And one piece that I'd like to, you know, from sort of from my perspective, so I'm at the general counsel of the university, and, and I guess similarly yes. people will come and report. It's always very helpful if your experience is something, know what the policy is when you're speaking to the subject matter expert. Read it in advance. So as they're going through, have a, have a learned conversation and have questions ready. Um, you, you mentioned something in terms of you may not get the accommodation. That First choice. You, that's usually like, FLQ on everybody's website when it has to do with FMLA, for example. Mm -hmm, if you're asking for an accommodation, know, know what your institution policy is and read the FAQs ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And then be prepared to cross-examine a little bit. I mean, I get cross-examined every day and I go, I was I was asking us. I was asking <laughs> We do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Carol and Jenny, we turn it back to you. Okay. Thank you so much. So sensational and so intuitive, wasn't it? Absolutely. And hey, the good news is later this afternoon, Clifton and Jessica will take an even deeper dive on this critical topic when they could co-facilitate a small group discussion on self-advocacy in the workplace. We can't wait, right? Okay. So we opened our webinar with music, and now we're going to close the circle with our final song. So Amanda and Rebecca will share a really empowering song, a favorite of Amanda's called Me Rebecca. If you happen to know it, feel free to join in. And irrespective of whether or not you know it, we invite you to take the message home with you in your head and your heart that each of us is strong and free and empowered to be what and who we choose to be. Oh, yeah. 